Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hi friends, did you know that about 6 to 18% of adolescent girls have polycystic ovary syndrome, otherwise known as PCOS? Today, we are exploring the basics of PCOS in teen girls with my guest, Angela Grassi. Angela is the founder of PCOS Nutrition Center. She's a writer and an award-winning dietitian. Having PCOS herself, Angela knows how frustrating living with this condition can be and firmly believes that you can take control over PCOS instead of letting it control you. She's dedicated her career to being being the leading edge or on the leading edge of helping people with PCOS improve their health and their lives through evidence-based nutrition and a health at every size approach. Welcome to The Nourished Child, Angela. Hi, Jill. It's great to be here with you. It's always fun to sit down with a friend. I know. I feel like I haven't seen you forever. I mean, we yeah. used to probably see each other at our annual meetings, but um, have not been at those for a few years. I know. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you here because you are like the expert on PCOS. And I know that a lot of parents out there who listen might not even know what the heck we're talking about. Um, Some parents might know exactly what we're talking about because they might be dealing with it themselves. So I was hoping to really have you give us sort of a master class on PCOS and how it shows up in teenage girls, what it is, and just all the goodies around, around this topic. So I thought we'd start with just what is PCOS? Yeah, so PCOS stands for polycystic ovary syndrome, and this is a hormone condition. It's, uh, like you said, it's really common. It affects around 7 million girls and women that live in the United States, so just in the United States. So it's actually the most common endocrine disorder among that age group, among Mm -hmm. uh, young women. And um, PCOS, as I said, it's a hormone condition, and hormones are chemical uh, messengers in our body. And in PCOS, the what's happening is the ovaries are producing higher levels of androgens. So androgens are male hormones. And all women have androgens, just like all men have estrogen. It's just when levels are higher than normal, uh, we see some problems with um, causing acne. We see problems with periods. We see problems with weight gain mm-hmm. uh, and all a whole bunch of stuff that I'm sure we'll get to. But um, yeah, it's it's really common. And unfortunately, it's, it's highly undiagnosed. Mm-hmm. So is this a genetic condition or are there other things in the environment that can cause it? Or where does it come from? That is a the million dollar or million billion billion dollar question. Um, we're not sure exactly what causes PCOS. Definitely, a genetic link has been discovered. Um, certainly, in, it runs in families. That if a mother tends to have it, uh, it's very likely that her daughters will have it, and um, we see it passed down from generations. But we also see that factors in the environment, endocrine disruptors. These are things like pollution and plastics and chemicals um, that we're exposed to, um, whether we want to or not, that they can affect our hormones. And uh, we even see it, you know, causing problems with fertility and could be a contributing factor to PCOS. Mm, Yeah, I was doing a little bit of research sort of going through PubMed and looking for some of the recent reviews. And, and one, one thing caught my eye was that it can happen as early as age eight. Some of the signs and symptoms, have, have you seen that? Yeah, I mean, some girls will start menstruating even at age eight. Early onset of periods is, is one uh, kind of red flag of this. But, but they're even finding that baby girls are born with polycystic appearing ovaries. Wow. 
Yeah. So this is definitely, you see the genetic link or the fetal programming, like being exposed to a high androgen environment. So androgens are like testosterone. So being exposed to that and being exposed to high insulin, which is another part of PCOS, um, that then programs the baby to um, to develop that. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to, you know, I'm thinking of that mom or dad out there who are saying polycystic. What does that even mean? Yeah. So poly means many. Cystic means cysts, and those are on the ovaries. Yeah. So basically what's happening is because of the hormone imbalance, the follicle that contains the egg doesn't necessarily get released every month. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what the fluid like, they call them cysts. They're actually little immature follicles that just hang out on the ovaries. And they are the result of the hormone imbalance. They're not the cause of it. Okay. So even though the name is kind of a misnomer, polycystic ovary syndrome, I mean, it does involve the ovaries, but the cysts aren't really cysts. They're little immature follicles. There's even been talk, Jill, about them changing the name oh. of PCOS to something more metabolic related. Mm -hmm. It's very controversial because uh, the researchers want it because then they'll get more funding if it's metabolic. Oh, because right now, PCOS is highly underfunded. It receives only, I think, less than 0.01% of funding from the NIH. Wow. It's less than endometriosis. It's, it's really low on the totem pole. So part of that is because it's a reproductive condition, but it's also an endocrine and no one's claiming responsibility. Mm. So we don't get a lot of research, but the researchers are pushing for a name change because then they can get more funding and they can do more studies. Gotcha. So, so the actual cysts that have evolved in polycystic ovary syndrome, the cysts aren't really cysts, they're underdeveloped follicles. And it's, is it the fo those follicles that are um, disrupting the chemical balance or the chemical ba balance is already there, imbalance uh, is already there and that's what causes the follicles? Right, it's the latter. The, it's a result of the hormone imbalance. So the, the cysts don't do anything or the follicles. They just hang out there. They're on the ovaries. But we see because of the hormone imbalance that that is contributing to these follicles being immature. They're not growing and they're not being released to be fertilized. Okay, so those little follicles are a result of the hormone imbalance. Correct. The end product. Correct. And really, those follicles or cysts, they just hang out there. They, they don't cause really any trouble. Uh, that's different from large cysts that women sometimes get that grow and sometimes rupture. Mm -hmm. That it usually is not seen in PCOS. In PCOS, they're teeny tiny little follicles. They also resemble a string of pearls that surround the ovaries on an ultrasound. Okay. And is that how it's diagnosed? So the diagnostic criteria for PCOS, right now it's an agreed upon criteria and it states that someone has PCOS if they have two of the following three. So the first is if they do an ultrasound and it's a transvaginal ultrasound. So some doctors are like, if it's teens and especially if they're not sexually active, like, is this harmful? You know, is this really necessary? It's almost mean yeah. to put them through this. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes as adolescents, those follicles might not even show up yet. They're really wondering if this is a necessary criteria for teens. But that is one of the criteria they could do a transvaginal ultrasound to look at the ovaries and they would see the string of pearls uh, on the ovaries. Mm -hmm. And some, some women with PCOS don't get that string of pearls at anyway. All. Okay, so if yeah. you don't have those string of pearls... If you don't have the cysts, what else, how else do they diagnose it? So then you have to look at periods. And if somebody has irregular periods or don't get their periods, that is uh, one of the criteria. So it's basically eight or fewer menstrual cycles in a year. Okay. 
So that's the big red flag to look for in your child is, are they getting their period or not? And if it's irregular, Mm -hmm. because it's not normal to not get your period. Yeah. Something's amiss, you know, something's not right. Mm -hmm. And then the other criteria is if they have signs of the elevated androgens, the elevated testosterone, so they could do blood work that would show elevated testosterone. Mm -hmm. And they can also look at the body and see if, you know, if, if the child has signs of elevated androgens. So that would be acne. And what teen doesn't get acne, you right. know? <laughs> acne, um, hair growth in the central part of the body. So lip area, chin, between the breasts, belly button area. It's usually the central part of the body. Okay. And that's a red flag of it. Hair loss or thinning. Um, those are the big things to look for. Okay. And so, gosh, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, less than eight periods a year, that could be, that could be somebody who is an athlete and is just, you know, suppressed hormonal secretion, uh, reduced, you know, based on low body weight. Absolutely. Is it a myth? Is it a myth that, um, individuals who have PCOS have extra body fat? No, that's that's not true. Um, PCO, PCOS can affect any body. It can affect people okay. who are underweight, you know, average. It can affect any 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 size body. Okay. So, but it always affects the reproduction. Reproduction. Yeah, but it usually causes a problem with periods. Now, you can have PCOS and have regular periods too. That's what I had heard. Um, yeah. Because I, I, had, I did have a client a long time ago who um, <clears throat> didn't come for PCOS. She came for, uh, at the time, you know, 10 years ago, weight management. She was, uh, you know, had, she was in, you know, pre-diabetic. Um, and when I, I, I just, so long ago, but I remember saying to her mother, you should have her checked for PCOS. There was something about her that just was like, this doesn't seem like straight up prediabetes. You know, she had the acanthosis, nigricans, and some of the other signs, but she had the extra hair growth and thinning right here at the top of her, of her head. And, and I was like, I think you should check for P, you know, take her back to the doctor and have them work her up. And she in fact did have it, did have it. Yeah. And again, adolescents might present differently. They might not uh, have a lot of these, and a lot of the symptoms are normal part of adolescence. So, I think um, the best thing that a parent and you know the teen can do is really trust their body. And if something's different and something's not right, whether it be rapid weight gain or acne that's not getting better despite trying Accutane and trying. Um, different lotions and stuff, if that's not getting better. And obviously the periods could be a big red flag. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what are s- sort of the outcomes of, you know, living with PCOS? What are parents and their children, their daughters potentially looking at in terms of uh, long time, long term consequences? Yeah, if if left untreated, PCOS can lead to type 2 diabetes, it can lead to heart disease, and we see higher rates of endometrial cancer. So it's important to shed that lining. If the uterine lining doesn't shed, then it can build up and cancerous cells can grow. So it's important to address this. And catching this early on is ideal because that can set the stage, like a lifetime of optimal health, you know, just learning what to do to take care of your body and to manage this. Because PCOS can be managed. You can live a full, healthy life with PCOS. You can have children. I know it's really scary when daughters get diagnosed with this and doctors often say you might have a hard time getting pregnant or, you know, you're not going to be able to have children. And it's so unfair to say that um, because no one knows might be a little bit more difficult, but if what I'm seeing is patients usually do have children with PCOS, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess I, as I think about it, you know, um, 
you have these signs and symptoms, these suspicions that parents can be sort of alerted to. Let's say a mom is like, okay, I'm listening to this and I think that I should have my daughter checked. What does she do then? She calls the pediatrician and says, I yep. want a PCOS workup. Yeah, I suspect PCOS. I've read about this. She's got a lot of signs and symptoms or we have this in our family. Um, I want her tested. And if the pediatrician doesn't know enough about testing it, they should refer out to whether it be a, a pediatric endocrinologist or mm-hmm. reaching out to a reproductive endocrinologist, depending on their age, mm-hmm. um, but somebody that can really, really test for this. So it's not a gynecologist. It's an endocrinologist. Not necessarily. It could be a gynecologist. What I like about going to um, maybe a reproductive endocrinologist is they usually have the ultrasound machines in their offices. Mm-hmm. If that's something that's going to be necessary and they specialize in sex hormones. Right. Um, it just depends on the doctor. I've had some OBGYNs that haven't picked it up and some that are just fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It also makes me think about the comment that you made earlier, which was that it's very underdiagnosed. And it makes me wonder about moms out there who might not know that they have it. What could be some of the signs other than, you know, irregular periods and extra body hair growth? Um what might tip them off to suspecting perhaps that they have PCOS or have have a relative in the family that has it? Yeah, there there chances are there's a mother listening to this and being like, "Oh my god, this is me. I never got my period and I gained all this weight and I had trouble getting pregnant." Um we know now that PCOS persists past menopause, that it just doesn't go away once you're done having children, that if anything, the metabolic aspects like the risk for type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, these are the things to be concerned about now. So mm-hmm. getting screened for that, knowing if you're at risk for diabetes, what the risk is, and um, you know, getting a full lipid panel, checking your cholesterol, checking for endometrial cancer, getting... Um, maybe uh, an ultrasound, if especially if you've gone long periods without getting uh, a period. Hey friends, this episode is sponsored by Seed. You've probably heard about the importance of nurturing kids' gut health. Seed is a microbial sciences company and creator of PDS08, Pediatric Daily Symbiotic, a two-in-one probiotic plus prebiotic that's been studied in children ages 3 through 17. It contains nine probiotic strains clinically studied for benefits across digestion, respiration, and skin health. 95% of children and adults in the U.S. do not reach their daily recommended fiber intake. With 5 grams of prebiotic fiber per serving, PDSO8 is a meaningful and easy complement to a healthy diet. It's also free from added sugar, artificial colors, preservatives, and 14 commonly recognized allergens. PDS08 sachet is designed to protect and shield from moisture, humidity, and light, so you can take it wherever you go. No refrigeration necessary. Start supporting your child's gut and health today. Go to www.seed.com forward slash nourished for a 20% discount. That's S-E-E-D dot com forward slash nourished for a 20% discount on your first month of PDS 08. Yeah, that's so, um, that's so interesting because I've, you know, I've wondered, um, not for myself, but just other family members. And I, you know, you see sort of different patterns happening and you wonder, or you wonder if people might be carrying this condition and not know about it. I'm sure. And you wonder how many women with type 2 diabetes really had PCOS to begin with, and it just wasn't picked up. And yeah. yeah. When you have the diagnosis, Let's say a family um, with a teenage daughter gets the diagnosis for their daughter. Then what happens? 
That's a good question. So it's always going to depend on uh, on the child and what their goals are. A lot of times, the first recommendation, especially if, if if you go see an OBGYN, it's take birth control, and that will regulate your periods. It'll decrease the risk for cancer, which is true because then you're shedding that lining. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of times, women don't get diagnosed with PCOS until they get go off the pill. And then it's like they're trying to get pregnant or whatever, and they're still not getting their periods when they go off of it. So I think it's always great if um, someone could visit with a registered dietitian nutritionist, you know, someone that specializes in PCOS, because we know that lifestyle is the primary treatment approach. And that involves, uh, you know, healthy eating, exercise sleep management, you know, how many teens aren't getting enough sleep these days, and that really affects hormones, and even stress management. These are all key lifestyle changes to start adopting now, and that will set the stage for a lifetime of of good health. So we're talking about, you know, how PCOS is diagnosed. Um, And when we're talking about teenagers, you know, what are the differences between diagnosis in an adult versus diagnosis in a teenager? That is a great question, Jill. So it's really going to depend on the teenager. But a lot of times with the diagnosis, we don't see, for example, in adolescence, we might not see those follicles on an ultrasound. And a lot of the symptoms that adolescents normally experience, like acne or extra, you know, hair growth or something like that, that is, you know, a common symptom of PCOS, but it's also a common symptom of adolescence. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's hard to know what's what. It's really, it could be tricky. If if a healthcare provider doesn't know what to look for, it can be hard to diagnose PCOS. Mm-hmm. But if the that provider knows what to look for, then uh, it's pretty clear. Yeah. I would say it, it would seem to me that, you know, additional body hair would be sort of a, a big obvious because I think the period... The period irregularity can be just so wacky at that age yeah. and time frame. Um, but okay, so so let's say that um, a family gets the diagnosis. They go to the pediatrician. They get referred out. I think you had mentioned uh, uh, a reproductive endocrinologist or an endocrinologist, or perhaps even a gynecologist as somebody who could make this diagnosis. So once the diagnosis happens, what what does a family find themselves doing in terms of treatment? Yeah, and a lot of times the first treatment recommendation given um, to to the patient is to take birth control pills. Mm. And while that has some pros, I mean, it can help to decrease the risk for endometrial cancer, which women with PCOS are at a higher risk for. Um, There's some disadvantages, too. It it definitely, the birth control pills can actually increase cholesterol and increase inflammation in in some individuals. But um, the pill is not necessarily the answer. Uh, And I think a lot of parents are wondering, do I have to put like my young child on birth control? They're not sexually active. They're so young. What else is there? And we definitely know that nutrition and lifestyle changes are the primary treatment approaches for PCOS. Mm-hmm. So this involves healthy eating and regular exercise, getting good good sleep, which is hard for teenagers to get right now. I have two of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's hard for adults to get enough sleep, but it's hard for teens especially. Yes. <laughs> and even stress management can really make a difference with those hormones. And uh, supplements, actually the right supplements, for example, vitamin D is really low in patients with with PCOS mm-hmm. and most of the most of the US population in general but we know that vitamin D is uh, also a hormone and that can affect other hormones. Interesting. So I think um working with a registered dietitian nutritionist mm-hmm. having uh, an evaluation with somebody a dietitian that specializes in PCOS that can really um help help your child to adopt good behaviors that's going to set the stage for a long, healthy life. Yeah. I have two thoughts going through my head. Number one, I can't believe you have teenagers because I literally remember when you had those babies. 
<laughs> I can't believe that. I can't believe it either. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, and then number two, you know, I'm working on a, a another book right now, and it is very lifestyle oriented. Um, but what I'd like to do is sort of unpack the lifestyle things as it uh, pertains to PCOS. So let's unpack nutrition, because I remember, um, you know, eating patterns, 10 years ago, the eating pattern thing was was a thing, right? Um, you know, I remember the, the low glycemic index. I don't even know if that's used anymore. Um, you know, so, so help me understand sort of what the current nutrition approaches are that are showing actual success uh, for young women with this. Yeah. And, you know, Jill, there is a ton of misinformation out there about nutrition recommendations for PCOS. You know, patients aren't getting the right information maybe from their healthcare provider. So, of course, you're going to go to the Internet and, and search for recommendations. And everybody's a nutritionist. Everyone's got an opinion. You know, there's so many PCOS influencers out there now that this worked for me. So this must be the way to eat. Mm. Like gluten free is like so popular in the PCOS social media scene. It drives me nuts. There's a really? lot of information. So again, working with a dietitian, but a big part of PCOS is the underlying insulin too. So we see that there's higher androgens, higher testosterone in PCOS, but a lot of women, around seventy percent, also s- suffer from insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. And insulin is a growth hormone. And it contributes to weight gain. It contributes to cravings. Like a lot of patients with PCOS will say, I, you know, I crave carbohydrates all the time or sugar, dessert, and it's really hard to stop eating. And it's not just a craving. It's like an intense, like need to have it immediately. And if you don't get it, you're just not satisfied. You're constantly thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So what we find is food can affect insulin levels. So a big treatment, because 70% suffer from insulin resistance, is geared towards lowering the insulin levels. Mm -hmm. And that can be done with eating a balanced plate. That's the approach I like to give with my patients. Yeah. Because I come from a non-diet approach. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm not going to have patients weigh, count, or measure food. But instead, look at the food combinations. Yeah. Like when we eat a balanced plate, what we're talking about is food that is high in fiber. So Mm -hmm. whole grains or fruits and vegetables. We want to see protein because if you eat carbohydrates without protein, it doesn't keep your blood sugar levels up enough and it doesn't stay with you longer. So then you get a dip in your blood sugar and you want more carbs to bring it back up. And that's a problem I see with young adults all the time is that their meals aren't balanced, you know, they might grab a bagel on the way out the door or or pop tart or, you know, bowl of cereal, they throw out the milk or something like that. They need to be having that protein, they need to be having some fat too, because fat helps fill you up. Mm -hmm. And fat doesn't really affect your insulin levels. Yeah. So that should be happening at every meal and even at snacks, trying to get that protein in trying to get that fat in. I know you promote that with your your snack ideas and your books, and yeah. it's just more satisfying. Otherwise, they're going back for another snack an hour later, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So a balanced plate focusing on protein and fiber, particularly, and some fat. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, what if a family comes to you, though, and and the daughter has gained has had rapid weight gain, for example, what is the, you know, what is the path uh, from there? Is it no different? Is it paying a little bit more attention, not only to balance, but perhaps just checking in with portion sizes? I don't know. What, what is, what is sort of the path these days? Yeah, it's still looking at the insulin levels. So, you know, doing the balance with the meals, um, but it's also working on mindful eating and, knowing uh, and checking in, like, are you eating enough? Are you getting satisfied? Can you leave the food? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of kids grew up in the clean the plate mentality, and they're used to having to finish everything on their plate, even if they're uh, full, you know, if they're no longer hungry, and and they don't need it then. So 
allowing children to have their freedom with their food choices, but to trust their own bodies to know what they need. And then, you know, having that regular exercise and movement is really key. And a lot of times if it is a rapid weight gain, you know, that's usually an underlying insulin resistance. So some doctors might even prescribe an insulin sensitizing medication to help bring down insulin levels. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned exercise and physical activity. Can you explain how that relates to, um, insulin levels and lowering insulin and helping overall with the management of PCOS? Yeah. So when we eat food, mostly carbohydrate food, but proteins too, they get broken down into glucose in our body. And that's what our cells use for energy. And so what happens is when we eat, our glucose level goes up. And when we exercise, our muscle cells take in that glucose really easily. Mm -hmm. We don't need added insulin in order to process. So it's really effective, especially after you eat, to go for like even a short walk or um, to ride a bike. Anything that gets your body moving can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And then I imagine that sleep has something to do with just cortisol and stress hormones and and things of that nature. That. And um, we're also seeing a very high prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in PCOS. And And is that related to body weight or is that like singularly related to PCOS? Yeah, they're finding it's related to the elevated androgens, that they're affecting sleep receptors in the brain and changing like the structure of, uh, you know, of how things work with breathing. It's really fascinating, but it's very prevalent. So if you notice if your child is snoring or choking for air, um, that is really something to to look into. Yeah. yeah. I just wrote the sleep chapter in my book about a month ago, and it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. I finished the chapter and I was like, okay, no parent is going to read this and not be able to change what they're doing or their perspective on sleep. It is so important. It's so important. Here are the schools. You know, my kids get up at 6 a.m. to get on a 6.30 a.m. bus. It's crazy. I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, not in line with the circadian rhythm. That not is, at all. That is true. Okay, let's talk about um, some of the emotional and psychological challenges that might come up um, in teen girls who have PCOS that parents should be sort of a little bit more heightened to or aware of. Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up because we see a higher prevalence of mood disorders and eating disorders in PCOS. And I think a lot of it is just dealing with this condition, being different or feeling different from your peers. You know, the clothing right now for teen girls are those half-cut shirts. Yes. And it's like you can't find anything else. And if you're in a bigger body, you know, you can can feel really uncomfortable with that. And so body image especially in our society that values thinness so much, it's really, really a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it can be really hard to deal with this and just to have the, you know, a diagnosis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So do you find that, um, you know, therapy is a good outlet for for some of these girls or is it something, you know, else, you know, group programs or support groups or what? What can a parent, what resources, you know, are there out there for parents um, and their and their daughters? Yeah, I don't think there's enough for teens, especially with PCOS. So that's a big problem. We have to mm-hmm. be addressing this more and have more resources for teens, online support groups that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. A lot of times teens don't even know, you know, it's not like they're talking about these symptoms a lot um, to their fears. So they might not know that, you know, the girl that sits next to them in chemistry also has PCOS, but they just yeah. feel really different. Yeah. And no one's like talking about this. Well, I do remember that one, you know, patient that I had a long time ago, I remember her feeling so relieved, the whole family so relieved that they knew what the cause that there was actually a cause. Because I think the other piece of this is that, especially if weight gain is involved, you know, families 
you know, they think that their, their child's eating too much or they're not, you know, getting enough exercise or they're being lazy or they're sneaking and they, 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 they must be sneaking food, you know, under my nose when this is really metabolically driven is what Absolutely. I'm hearing you say. It's not the child's fault that they have this. I have athletes that were training for a triathlon and they were gaining weight, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not their fault. It's not because they're eating too much. They have a metabolic condition. Uh, usually, you know, the insulin is a big part of it and that needs to be addressed. But by making them, you know, withholding food or making them exercise, that just backfires. I think the child needs to get educated Mm -hmm. um, and understand how this works and take ownership of their body. And I think the more the parents intervene in a way uh, can backfire. Yeah. Depending yeah. on the child. Some people might like the support. Maybe if a parent goes for a walk or bike ride with their child or yeah. encourages different activities, but uh, other ways, you know, it's a lot of blame and how does, and even before the diagnosis of PCOS, right? You gained all this yeah. weight, you must be eating too much or snacking or sneaking food. And that's not the case at all. And the child's like, no, I'm not. And the parent's not trusting them. And it causes a division of, uh, you know, mistrust there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so parents out there, if you're <laughs> listening, if your child has PCOS, it is not an eating problem. It is a metabolic problem. It is a hormonal problem. Absolutely. So Angela, if parents want to learn more about PCOS in teenagers, do you have some resources you can point them to or your favorite books or websites or anything like that? Yeah, well, I have um, at the PCOS Nutrition Center, we have a lot of good free tips and recipes and a couple books there. I wrote a book called The PCOS Workbook, Your Guide to Complete Physical and Emotional Health. So mm -hmm. that's a good one. And I have some additional resources that, you know, helpful links for teens there too. Okay. Um, there's one at Boston's Children's Hospital. They have a good PCOS center with some links for teens there. Okay. Um, that can be really helpful and a great nonprofit for PCOS. It's called PCOS Challenge, okay. the National Polycystic Ovary Association, and mm -hmm. they have a lot of information there. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Angela. It's so fun to see you face to face. <laughs> to see I miss, you. I we got to get together in person one day. I Maybe know it. I know it. That would be friends. fabulous. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I think that um, this is something hopefully is going to build awareness. And, and I will just say to, to listeners out there, September is PCOS Awareness Month, right? And we are doing this interview in September, although this will probably come out in October or November. But we are honoring uh, PCOS awareness. And um, if you suspect your child may have PCOS, please go see your healthcare provider, your pediatrician, a dietitian. Don't automatically go to putting your child on a diet or thinking that your child is, you know, overeating or this, that, or the other. Really think about your family history, your own history, and perhaps you know, you, your child may have PCOS, which is, is something that needs to be um, a, diagnosed and addressed. Yep. And it's very treatable. Yes. And very treatable. Angela, thank you so much. Great to see you, Jill. You too. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.